You have a quote in the book that says, when you're hungry, you have one problem, but when you have food, you have many problems. That's an interesting conundrum. When I was doing it, I became much more aware of the conversations people have. So, you know, when there were a whole lot of terrorism in Europe, I said to someone, you know, someone was going, I'm not going to go there because, you know, there's too much terrorism. And I showed them a graph that showed that terrorism in Europe has gone down. There's no IRA bombings. There's no, you know, Libya stuff. And so actually it's gone down. But it was interesting how unpopular that was, that I would share that information because clearly it can't be right because I see about it on the news. And all I was doing was trying to make them feel comfortable to go on a trip that is actually safer than it's ever been. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. I am happy you're here. Let me ask you a question. Why does everybody seem to think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket? Why is the news always bad? Why do economic models always come back to saying we are on the brink of disaster because wages are stagnant, inequality is growing, and the earth is heating up? We have all these inescapable macro problems that will end in our doom. Well, that's the question that my guest today, Grant Ryan, wanted to address in his new book, Comparonomics, because there are an awful lot of economic studies that indicate that we are worse off than we have ever been. And yet, when you do what Grant did in this book, and you take a step back and go, hang on a second, forget about the model. Let me just ask myself, when you take the aspects of life that are most important, nutrition, how we live, food, tolerance, the presence of racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. And you compare where we are today as a world and as a society, how does that compare to the way people lived 50 years ago or 250 years ago? Are we better off or are we worse off? As you walk through Grant's model, you start to see that, gosh, you know, the food we have today is so much better and healthier than what we had 50 years ago. Hey, you know what? As I think about it, I would much rather have gotten cancer in 2021 than in 1971 because the medicines and techniques available to treat it are far more advanced than they were just a few decades ago. Well, how are we doing from a racism, sexism, and homophobia perspective? Well, as much as there is left to do for improving those things, I think we're a whole lot better off than we were 50 and definitely 250 years ago. So why do we always feel like the news is so bad? Well, Grant dives into this in Comparonomics, and he shares a lot of the biases that we walk around with as human beings that tend to make us look for and find the negative or tend to have the negative find us and how in our world that is powered by social media, how we tend to share things that are more negative than not. As I talked to Grant and as I read his book and contemplated his theory I think it's an important message that each of us needs to remind ourselves of on a daily basis because life really is much better than a lot of people out there, the media, politicians, other interest groups on either side of the political spectrum want you to think it is. And you will be happier when you stop worrying about crap that doesn't matter and you start thinking about what is good in life as opposed to what is broken. Not that there isn't a lot to fix. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Grant Ryan. You can see a link to his book, Comparonomics, in the show notes. I hope you'll take a few minutes today to contemplate what his message means for you. This is Grant Ryan. Grant Ryan, welcome to Crazy Money. Uh, thanks for having me. Grant, you've just published a book called Comparonomics. What is Comparonomics and why did you write it? It's a book that really points out how much better life is than most people are commonly aware of. I have a background in economics and I guess I've just observed over the years, we all have so many goods and products that a billionaire even five, 15 years ago couldn't have, but we all kind of feel like we're stressed and struggling. And I was always intrigued by that difference that we can be doing so much better. You know, we live 10 years longer than we did 50 years ago, but we all think the health system's completely fallen to pieces. There seems to be a dichotomy there. It's really about digging into that. So traditional economic models, a lot of publishing I've read over the last decade uh, tells us that things are in dire straits. Inequality is increasing. Uh, The real wage for the average person is stagnant at best. Why is your conclusion different than what we're being told on the news every night? Because economics is great at measuring from one quarter to the next, but it's actually not very good at measuring things that are completely different. So how do you compare 
an open heart surgery that you've got a high chance of dying to a day procedure where you put a stent in. Uh, from a GDP point of view, it goes down, but for us, it's great. When I was growing up, you had to be rich to have a set of encyclopedias. <laughs> now you have something. You did. Yeah. You, and now you li- literally get something a hundred or a thousand times better for free. That's right. From a GDP point of view, it's gone down wildly better for us. I had to save up to buy a cassette. I'm showing my age. Now I've got anything. Well, I, there's no way a billionaire could have any of those things not that long ago. And it's because economics isn't designed to measure that we quite like living 10 years longer. As soon as something becomes free, economics doesn't count it, which is really kind of, it's not a very good way of measuring progress. So, you know, I kind of think that if we spend time on it, that's a measure of degree of importance as well. So the fact that we, you know, are still like listening to music, even though it's relatively inexpensive, doesn't mean that that's less important. And so it, it is a bit of a challenge to people to say, if you look at the details of why economics doesn't measure it, it gets boring very quickly. <laughs> right. So what yes. I tried to do was to, that I'm most proud of is actually I invented a little tool and I just say, hey, Paul, what's important to you? Um, and you might say, from an economic point of view, well, it's my housing and it's my entertainment and my health and what have you. And then I walk you through a little thing and I say, well, how does it compare to, say, the golden age of the 1970s when we were growing at 4 to 6%? And you go, well, health, well, that was, that was pretty shitty. You know, we would live nearly 10 years less. If you got leukemia, you typically died. Now you typically live. That's actually quite good. So you go, well, that's way better, even though from an economics point of view, it's about the same about of shuffling around. And so when people say real wages haven't changed, it doesn't mean that life hasn't gotten dramatically better. It's just economics doesn't measure it very well. Let's dive into an example. You use two different time periods, the difference between the reign of King Louis, I think the 14th you said, and the modern day, and then the difference between 50 years ago, uh, 1972, and the modern day. So walk us through some of these, the way you compared these time periods and the way we live in the respective ones. Yeah, the King Louis one was, I just thought I'd say, well, let's take one of the richest people in history who was so rich that the peasants got together and started to chop his head off. <laughs> That's pretty rich. There was a bit more to it than that. But you immediately think of his palaces and the intricate gardens. You go, man, he was richer than us. And you do a traditional economic model and you say he's worth billions of dollars. But then you say that intricate garden was designed as the ultimate luxury place to defecate because they didn't have flush toilets. <laughs> you know, they lived half as long because, you know, they thought it was good to fix eye infections with urine and children opioids, which, you know, has some merit potentially, but, you know. And then you go, well, what was the fastest way you could get around? It was on a horse. I'm like, none of us would swap our lives to that. What was his best sort of entertainment? If you look at what we've got, we wouldn't, you know, they're sort of a jest is kind of cool, but, you know, if we want to communicate, there's just so many things you walk through and you go, man, And you go, well, at least he had great food. And you go, well, it took hundreds of people to prepare it. And they didn't know washing your hands was a good idea. So it would be illegal to serve food that way these days because of sanitation reasons. And if King Louis walked into a modern supermarket, he'd be blown away. All the outer season vegetables and all the craft beer and all sorts of wonderful things we have now. So the point of that example was just to say, oh, heck, one of the richest people in the world, I actually wouldn't want to swap my life with him if I look at all the things I actually care about now. And then you go, but hang on, he's worth billions of dollars. And I'm happy. well, that doesn't really make much sense. So I'm just getting people to go, well, why doesn't economics measure it through? Well, it's because it's not designed to measure things that are completely different. How do you compare a safe car to a horse? <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I mean, you laugh, but that's actually, you know, we do it all the time because things – go from impossible for anyone to consider the basic human rights. So, you know, I've got a militant child who's like, high-speed internet should be a basic human right because it's so useful. And, you know, of course, and you're like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, 15 years ago, a billionaire didn't have Yeah. So between Louis' time and our time, housing has gotten better, healthcare has gotten better, sanitation's gotten better, food's gotten better. Has anything gotten worse in that time? I want to admit that healthcare by country differs today, but in the aggregate, even in the worst of, let's say, the developed countries, it's way better than it was 250 years ago. 
Absolutely. I think there are plenty of things that are worth. So the first part of the book is really about giving you a tool so you can work through and work out how things better. But the second part of the book is really about why things don't feel better. And there's lots of reasons why they don't feel better. And the point of the book was really to make people really aware of those things. Because if you think your life is worse just because, you know, real wages have changed. And I just say that's, I mean, it's such an inappropriate way to measure how we're getting on. And if that's what you think and you keep doing the same things, you're not going to make any difference. You've got to get to the root cause of why. So there's definitely more stress than there used to be. There's more, you know, feelings of pressure and, you know, the issues around inequality and, and all of those sorts of things. But, yeah, it's really about, and again, it's not trying to say, you know, don't worry, be happy. It's about saying, explain to people how the machine works so that you can see that actually, if you look at it, did you do the little exercises? Because normally what happens is people do the, read it and they go, oh, that can't be right. We can't be doing that much better. And they go off and have a wee play with a wee graph and then they go, oh, yeah, actually we're probably quite a lot better off than the economists are telling us. I didn't do the exercises, but I didn't need to do the exercises. I agreed with you. I, I mean, I think there's probably the one thing, and for the people who are listening and don't have the graphics in front, is you have time period before on the left, and you have time period current on the right. On the vertical axis, it's just, are things better or are they worse? For all the things that are better, and the, most of them are better, the only thing to debate is, by what slope, by what degree are they better or worse. So how much better is food net of all the other caveats we've said? How much better is healthcare net of all the caveats? And so that's where the debate can really, you could spend a lot of time over beers, which by the way, is a lot better today than it was 50 years ago, even in America, especially in America. You know, you could have those debates over beers and say, well, yes, but, or for these people, but not these people, et cetera. Yeah. And so the point of it is just to make a quick little diagram that gives people an explicit way of expressing how they think things have changed. And no one's going to agree exactly on the slopes. What most people do is they go, oh, yeah, actually, when you look at it, most of the things I care about, they're dramatically better. So when you say things like before real wages have barely budged, what you should really be saying is, why is that such an inappropriate measure? I mean, Sure, real wages haven't budged, I agree, but it's not very good at measuring completely different things. And it's not commonly understood. <laughs> and it actually drives a lot of people to think that the reason I feel crappy is that, you know, I have, we're no better off. And you know, there's political movements based on it. Make America great again. Oh, this is not a political book at all, but it's just like, it has real implications, not understanding this stuff. And without diving into the political ramifications of the slogan, let's talk about why Make America Great Again was such an effective political slogan. I'm from New Zealand, so I really don't follow American politics. I was just making the point that... Um, There's biases that slogan tapped into, right? Yeah, there is. There's a formal name for it, which is called rosy retrospection. So you basically remember the good things from when you grew up and various bits and pieces. And it is fun when you grow up because you don't have worries and things. And then as you grow up, you've got more stress and strain. And so you kind of think that things are getting you know more stressful. It's a very normal, well-understood thing. It goes back to the 17th century. Everyone has always looked back on how great the good old days were. But the thing that makes the most great is a bad memory. Because when you go and you sit down and you say, would you give your children what I had when I was growing up so that if they got leukemia, they died? You go, well, no, I wouldn't want that. Would you make it so that it costs $2 to call grandma on the other side of the country? No, no, I wouldn't want that either. Do you want to make them save up so they can buy one cassette a week? <laughs> no, nah, don't really want that. You just go through this right. list and you go, well, actually, that's none of that was really very good. Feels good. But there's complications with technology, right? You know, when I was a kid, we had this world book encyclopedia, 26 volumes. We didn't get the annual updates because those were too expensive. We had 26 volumes and it was easy to understand all the world's information because there it was on the shelf in the living room, right? But now today I'm overwhelmed with information. So am I better off than I was when I was a kid and at lower expectations? It's a matter of getting to the nub of you know, why do you feel overwhelmed? And, you know, when I go through the, the things that make us feel bad, you know, it tries to get into the nub of why we feel overwhelmed so that you can use these tools appropriately as you want to. But I don't think 
like I had a friend who had a set of encyclopedias. I love going around to his place. I'm showing what a geek I am. But I had that same love. But I love the fact when someone spouts something about no one vaccinates for measles in Sweden anymore. And I'm like, really? And you go, that's bollocks. Now, that may not have even been in a set of, oh, sorry, probably not allowed to say that on this podcast, but anyway. But nobody here knows what bollocks means. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> giving me permission to say all sorts of things now. There are no censors, first of all. And secondly, secondly, we probably slip them right by. So, Well, let's talk about some of these biases because these are things that, that affect our behavior without us being conscious of them most of the time. And we're allowing ourselves to be manipulated by our own brains and by the media and by scientists. Let's talk about some of the most important ones that drive this glorification of the past and our attention that gets paid to negative information in the present. Well, it's a very well-known thing that served us well as we evolved. When you hear a lion, you know, you want to be aware of that. And so we're heightened for threats. And so our brain is designed, so bad news sticks in there like Velcro and good news kind of slips off. And so that's a very well-known and understood thing. And what happens is that in the past, you may have got a newspaper in the morning and had a quick flick through it and you got a little bit of it. But now we have news all the time of all the bad things. And so you get this constant stream of it. It's actually more intriguing than that, than that what I've been observing is just how socially normal it is to grumble about things. You know, I actually think there's a natural level of grumpiness that we have. And you can tell how good life is by what we grumble about because we kind of grumble about all sorts of things. But if I tell you I was trying to deal with the government or a bank or insurance company about something and they were hopeless and you'll have a story about how horrible they are and how useless they are. And it's surprisingly antisocial if you reply, oh, I talked to a couple of people from an insurance company last week and they're really nice. It's so comical to do that because people are like, what? <laughs> We're kind of attuned to have a bit of a grumble. I mean, I use it as a measure of how good life is because, for example, in the, I live in a little village by the sea in a harbour. It's beautiful in New Zealand. And when the pandemic was going down, you know, we were in lockdown, but someone wanted to put fairy lights on some historic buildings and the amount of angst, you know, the debate within the community, you know, people got banned from Facebook and all sorts. <laughs> and I'm like, what a great place to live. Right. <laughs> you find a lot of things that people grumble about are really high class, first class problems. You know, when you think about a historic. You have a quote in the book that says, when you're hungry, you have one problem, but when you have food, you have many problems. That's an interesting conundrum. One of the things when I was doing it, I became much more aware of the conversations people have. So, you know, when there were a whole lot of terrorism in Europe, I said to someone, you know, someone was going, I'm not going to go there because, you know, there's too much terrorism. And I showed them a graph that showed that terrorism in Europe has gone down. There's no IRA bombings. There's no, you know, Libya stuff. And so actually it's gone down. But it was interesting how unpopular that was that I would share that information because clearly it can't be right because I see about it on the news. And all I was doing was trying to make them feel comfortable to go on a trip that is actually safer than it's ever been. So what are the benefits of thinking about things as they are as opposed to believing whatever studies come across the transom? Well, it gives you a more realistic understanding of life and it actually makes you realize that doing the same old things isn't going to fix it because you don't actually understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling. The other one that is, makes a big difference is, you know, the social media. So it's been well known for a long time that comparison is the theft of joy. You can't help it when you see one of your peers has suddenly got something and you feel a pang. It's a normal thing and we all kind of know that. But what social media has done is it's amplified it. So you can now see a lot more people and you see just the polished version of their lives. If you spend time on that, you can't help but feel like, man, I'm doing pretty shit, you know. I can't be very good. And so it's kind of taken a very normal thing that we've kind of evolved with, made it dramatically, you know, harder. In fact, you've got some of the best minds in, in the valley have basically designed tools to manipulate your amygdala, to give you these little dopamine hits. It's incredibly um, addictive. And there's plenty of good with it as well. But unless you understand some of those things, you can, there's many, many studies that show if you spend your time on the social media, you feel worse. And we actually know why that is, but most people don't know why. And 
it's kind of important that you do because when you do, you become a lot less immune to it. Will you share the story of the monkey and the cucumber, please? Yeah, so this is a, an experiment where there's monkeys in each, each cage and they're both given cucumber, they're both happy, and then suddenly one monkey is given grapes and the other one isn't and the you know the other monkey gets visibly upset and throws the cucumber at the re- research so, <laughs> i love i love that story it's come up before but it's so perfect it is so perfect so we have this innate want to do better than our neighbors and you know as you know when you get to the end of the book that's kind of part of the thing that kind of pops up around you've talked about it on with a lot of your guests around it's actually an unwinnable game for us to all be at the top of the pyramid, you know, in terms of status. And when you realize that, you're like, oh, you know, maybe we really need to think about, well, how can we make it more viable for everyone to actually, you know, participate and, and not feel as bad depending on what your status is? Because it's not a winnable game for everybody. As your previous guests have said, there's a lot of luck involved. And the idea that it's all based on skill. Is, so anyway, you talk about meritocracy and that letting go of the meritocracy, of a belief in meritocracy is one of the keys for seeing the world as it should be as opposed to the way it is. And the theory there is that, well, you know, people are born on third base and think they've hit a triple, right? That luck and genetics play a much bigger role. In our, and we talked about this with Robert Frank, the Cornell professor who was on a few months ago, that luck and genetics play a much bigger role in our in the outcome. That the number one determinant of where we end up economically in Western societies is who our parents are, not how hard we work. But people of the same genetics, my brother and I could be given the same opportunity to score on a test and one of us could go out drinking and the other one could stay up all night and studying. Who's going to do better on that test? And is meritocracy a legitimate portion of outcomes that we should put in perspective, but not dismiss completely. I completely agree that, you know, it takes work and skill, but then it takes, takes luck as well. And the reason it's important is that if you think back to the old days of class society, where you were born into the aristocracy or you were born to be in service, everyone knew it was luck. You know, you happened to be born into the right family and you thought you were better kind of, and you, it was unlucky you were born down there. But at the moment, what we have is if you're at the top, you're there not because of luck, but because I'm so awesome. It, it gives a tone that is like even worse than, you know, the luck of being born into the right family. But even worse at the bottom is the people are not there just because they were unlucky to be born there, but I'm there because I'm useless. And we actually know that that's not necessarily always the case. Well, it's not the case a lot of the time. The story I like to tell is that if you need brain surgery, Sure, you need a brain surgeon and we might bow down to him, but you need someone to clean the theatre and you need someone to run the cafe and even do the parking tickets. And, and why do we make it so hard for those people to feel, you know, a valued part of society? It seems weird. We need them all. We'll have robots for that very soon, so don't worry about that. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just replace them completely. Why would we want everybody to work reasonably hard to get the rewards that are available. Not that the rewards are equal, but shouldn't we be encouraging people to work at some optimal level of effort? Yeah, I think we should. And Well, what I'm really saying with the views around status is that I make a comparison to, you know, racism and sexism, you know, years ago, it's a very normal thing to not be racist. Now it used to, it was kind of common and same with sexism. And, and homophobia. So these are the things that have gotten clearly better just in the last 50 years, right? Racism, sexism, and homophobia. And, and homophobia in the last 20 years, really. And it's got a long way to go, but the differences are dramatic. What I'm kind of making an analogy towards is that why do we have statuses? Why do we bow down to people who've got more money than us and look down on people that don't? When you realize there's an element of luck involved as well, which there is, no one can really debate that when you look at the research. Why is it okay to treat people that have to do a job that you wouldn't want to do worse than... So it's kind of like the last... I call it the last greatism because it's the last thing where we're all collectively allowed to treat people differently based on something that is... A lot of it is quite arbitrary. And when you look at it like that, it's actually quite refreshing because I basically... I don't bow down to anyone. I've met all sorts of interesting, wildly rich people and don't really care. 
and ditto, a lot of my friends are, are people that are not very wealthy at all. It's one of the joys of living in a little town is that there are, everyone goes to the same school, everyone mingles with everyone. You can't afford to have these layers of social hierarchies. Whereas when I lived in a bigger town, I wasn't even aware that I only hung out with people that we'd all done quite well. We're all relatively wealthy. And it is kind of interesting. And then I'm very heightened when people, when you go out for a meal and someone's just rude to the wait staff, you know, it just winds me up even more. I'm like, there's a lot of luck involved that we're not on the other side of that. And they're just humans getting by. There's no need to be a dick about it. So, you know. You do spend the last section of the book talking about statusism. So status as a punitive bias that we walk around with consciously or unconsciously that is similar to racism, sexism, treating people differently based on some attribute of their humanity that is not of their choosing for the most part. And what are the benefits besides just small town collegiality that if we minimize statusism, what would accrue to humankind that we currently don't have? Well, I think it would make the uh, people at the top a little more humble about things. And I think it would make the vast majority of people who are getting by not try and struggle to get to a place that is impossible for them all to get, but to accept that actually, irrespective of my income, it doesn't mean I'm a worse person. Right. And Actually, I'm not treated like a worse person. Like, I think that's actually worse than having a low income. Is feeling it's bad. How badly we yeah. treat people yeah. and how badly we treat people. So why do we have to make the person who, you know, is that the, I actually see the bigger advantage of it is that once you get to this mind point, you realize, well, actually, people are all just people getting by and they're doing the best that they can with what they've got. And, and, and that, I think, is mostly the case. And that... You shouldn't necessarily treat people, you know, worse or better based on their status. I think it then gets to the point at which you go, you almost need to do that before you think it's okay to, for example, have a, you know, less inequality. I don't want the person who's responsible for my brain surgery to struggle so badly that they're thinking about what they're going to do when they're cleaning or something. Why can't they have a decent life as well? Why do we make it so hard? Mm. Because at the moment we do. We make it really hard. And if you've ever being poor, it's not much fun. I've been poor for a brief period of time and it isn't fun at all. For a couple of years, it was a drag. I felt powerless. And every day I, w I would wake up and I would start thinking about money before I brush my teeth. There's studies that say when you're poor, you, you know, you lose about 10 IQ points, depending on, you know, how it works. It, it actually makes people less able to function. It's a crippling thing. So do you think that's a realistic goal? I mean, aren't we social animals for whom hierarchy is a natural way of organizing ourselves? Yes, we are. And I would say it's exactly the same. We're universally homophobic, racist, and sexist. Uh, not me. Recently. Not me. No, sir. Not me. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I was saying as a society... We've all evolved a lot in the last few decades. But what I think is quite interesting is how quickly it's kind of changed. Like, it's hard to believe that it was only 100 years ago that no woman in the world had to vote. And that's taken quite a long time before it, it happened. You know, we, we at least acknowledge that they may be able to contribute something. And we're not there at all. And just 50 years ago, you said that women in, the, in America had to have their husband's permission to apply for a credit card? Or their fathers. Oh my yeah. gosh, that seems crazy. Yeah, can you imagine that? Kind of? <laughs> But we've made this dramatic progress. With Me Too, we've got plenty of room to go. But, you know, we've made this progress. So this is why, if you don't understand the kind of progression, but I'd say we've actually made a lot of progress on racism as well in that it doesn't take very far to go back and you watch an old movie and just realize how baked in racism was mm -hmm. and acceptable, and now it's completely unacceptable in, in most of those formats. But even better, the one you mentioned around homophobia, it's changed so dramatically from people thought it was you know, bad enough that they should, should be locked up, which it was when I grew up. When I said I was homophobic, it was because I was, because you know it was illegal, so of course. And now most people I know just don't give a damn. Right. So these things can actually change quite quickly, and I think that changing our views around status is a key to then changing a lot of the other things that then you know, will fall out. And it's hard to not do that. If Why would I want to um, pay a little bit more tax if I'm the greatest and I've earned it all and those people are all losers that deserve 
to be down there. I mean, you kind of need to change that before you think it's okay to maybe distribute some of this you know, bounty that we collectively have. So now Daniel Pinker wrote a book called, I believe, Rationality Now. Is that the name of the book for Enlightenment now, Enlightenment now. now, right. He demonstrated extensive economic data or put forth extensive economic data proving his point that things have gotten much better over decades and centuries. He was really taken to task by progressive media for trying to make that argument. On the one hand, you're making the, you're making the same argument that things are better than people say they are. On the other hand, which might be labeled a more conservative argument, and you're also making the argument at the same time that status is really holding us back for the kinds of society we should have, which might be labeled a more progressive argument. Where where do you fall? And are you taking heat from both sides for making these arguments that no one will be happy with in the end? Yeah, I think no one's happy unless you fit into a box. Right, <laughs> right, right. I'm a big believer that the reason we're doing so well is because of the creative destruction of you know cool. capitalism. And, and it's produced amazing things but then at the same time you can go the reason i talk about the status is that it's you know brutally unfair around how if you take it to the limit so i don't think you have to sit in a box the point of this book was not to prove one i'm actually not political at all i kind of wrote all over the place but the three parts of the book the first part was to give people a tool so rather than stephen pinker which i really like giving a whole lot of data on why things are better. I wanted to give people a tool so they could work it out themselves. So it's not me telling you how things are. You work it out and then you go, ah, oh, okay, well, if things are better, the whole second part of the book is if, I, if things are better, why don't I feel better? And again, there's a whole lot of things that are very well understood in the literature that most people don't know about. And actually knowing about them goes a long way. And the third part of the book was to say, well, what policies are going to make us feel better? And I took things purposely from the left and the right, and I actually showed them neither actually make as much difference as you might think. <laughs> in fact, they don't make a lot of difference. They don't make any difference to propensity to grumble or compare ourselves to each other or there's a whole range of different things around that. And that's when I was, I was as surprised as anything about that. And that's when I came up with the two new things, which is really to understand those things that make us feel bad. And I find it useful every day, pretty much. Because you're aware of those things and you catch yourself indulging in some of the biases that you mentioned? Yeah, so this afternoon when someone um, grumbles or something, I'm sure you'll observe it differently than you might have otherwise. And then you can still participate. And it doesn't mean, because if someone tells me a story about something and I'm like, yeah, I got a letter from the council telling me to remove noxious weeds because they're coming in from a property next door that's owned by the council. And, you know, it's funny. You, you can have a kind of a grumble you don't go into a spiral of doing about the grumbleness and then you, when you understand the, so understanding helps. And then the other thing that just caught me when I was looking at all of these things was how many of them are about us comparing ourselves to each other, mm. which is unwinnable. And then how do you solve that? And there's lots of people written about how pervasive status is and, and the conclusion is it's just a game you've got to play. And I'm like, well, actually it's a game I think you can reject. I personally have rejected it for, about five or six years as I've been playing and writing with these ideas. And it's remarkably freeing, I can tell you. You know, it's interesting. I found your book because I was looking up books about comparison because I really am fascinated about the human tendency to compare. And I find it, especially, you mentioned Richard Reeves in the book who wrote a book called Dream Hoarders. He was one of, an early yeah. guest on the program. And it's all about how upper middle class people look at rich people. And because, because the income curve is so steep, at the higher levels of income, really rich people are not twice as rich as kind of rich people. They're a thousand times as rich. And so the people that have, you know, upper middle class incomes don't feel like they're well off, but they're actually doing very, very well. And that kind of comparison, why don't those people feel good about what they have? That's what I was looking for. And I came across Comparonomics, which utilizes that human tendency to compare, to analyze kind of more macro problems. So I find it a coincidence that these things are so interrelated. It's kind of a little bit ironic that I use comparisons all the time in the first part of the book to show how good we are. And then in the end, I say one of the solutions is to not compare ourselves to each other because it's unwinnable. So it's kind of a, a bit, a bit ironic. But really. to catch ourselves when we see somebody else's vacation on Facebook and say, okay, well, that's the best part of their life, not the average part of their life. When the news serves us images of death and destruction and sharks killing people, 
that we know that, that our lizard brain is being manipulated. And then when politicians or, or people with an agenda tell us things are terrible or great, they might have their own agenda. Yeah, and so being aware of them, there's you know, other ones that I find you know, surprisingly useful around, it just seems that it's a normal thing that humans have a bit of joy and a bit of sorrow. And it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or you're a prisoner, you have good days and bad days. And so it's easy, you can see people, they see the bad news, they're feeling bad, they've got a bad day, the world's shit, they get into a spiral. My life is about as good as you could get. Um, but, you know, you still have good days and bad days. You realize when you have a bad day, it's just actually it's just part of being a human. It doesn't mean the world's rubbish. And, again, that's just one of the things I've listed in the book that I wasn't aware of that until I'd done the research. And then it actually makes it a lot more understandable. And you go, oh, I'm just being a human. That's okay. Tomorrow's probably going to be a bit better. And it gives you a perspective. It's not about... Like I emphasize, I'm not saying don't worry, be happy, happy, clappy. It's basically saying here's how the world works. We're told real wages are no better, but that actually doesn't make any sense. You know, we're actually way better off. The reason we don't feel bad is all of these different things. And when you understand them, it gives you power to participate, but not go into a spiral. And then when you look at some of the other higher level things, it's around, it's kind of like I'm explaining how the treadmill works. And I'm saying the screen in front of you is not telling you how it really is and giving you permission to stand off and then you realize you don't go flying backwards and you're like, oh, wow, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Grant, I really enjoyed the book, Comparanomics. Where can our listeners find out more about you? Comparanomics.com has got um, a blog and a few bits and pieces. Yeah, the book's on Amazon, so. All right, Comparonomics is Comparonomics, by the way. I, my spelling was off a few times. I found the book very thought-provoking. I appreciate your work and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Well, there you go. I'd love to hear what you all think about Grant's ideas about his book. There's a link to his book and the website, Comparonomics, in the show notes. On that website, you can make your own graphs. Share them on the Crazy Money Podcast listeners' Facebook page. It's up there for a reason. You can shoot me a note at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com with your thoughts. I accept love mail and hate mail, whichever you feel compelled to share. Let's jump to the takeaways, ladies and gentlemen. The news is not always your friend. Let's be clear about that. Yes, you should take the time to be an informed citizen, to brush up and read up on current events, but let's never forget the fact that the news does not exist to inform you. The news does not exist to help you get closer to the truth of how the world works. The news exists to sell soda, toothpaste, automobiles, and other things like that. Now, Advertising is how I made my living before I got into the uh, the highly lucrative world of podcasting. It's not like I'm anti-marketing. It's not like I'm anti-media. But never forget, the way they sell soda, toothpaste, and automobiles is to get you coming back. And the way they get you coming back is by creating sensational content to intrigue you and lure you in. That sensational content is overwhelmingly negative compared to what they could be telling you about. And that's the way our brains work. We are attracted to the negative. Try to catch yourself when you're doom scrolling, when you're watching hours and hours of television, when basically what you needed was five minutes of data, and then you could get out and go take a walk in the sunshine. Takeaway number two, this was a quote in the book that we didn't spend as much time on that I really would have liked to have. All models are wrong, but some are useful. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that we can learn from a lot of different things and that even if we don't agree with the conclusion of certain economic models or analyses of other things in the world, that we can take a step back and say, this might offend the way I believe the world is or should be, but is there something I can take away from it? And I think the more open-minded we can be about other people's impressions of the way the world is, them seeing it through a different perspective than us, we'll be better off and we can be more confident in our own opinions because we've considered the fact that we might be wrong. Is that a good idea? Mm, ah, let's think about that. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Lastly, number three, pick your friends carefully. The more negative they are, the more negative you'll be. We don't need any one of us to be vessels of passing on negativity, of amplifying it. And, you know, when you're out there posting on Facebook, just ease back on the outrage. And I could do that too. I know. I know I could. Anyway, thanks for listening all the way to the end. I appreciate you being here. 
Next week, we'll have essays from spring break to read. And then coming back after spring break, lots of great new guests that I know you'll enjoy listening to. In the meantime, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.